All right, at ease. Everybody listen up. First off, need you to do something for me. Go to streetwarriorradio.com. Do your Amazon shopping through there. I know you're going to shop on Amazon. I know it. You know how I know it? Because Amazon is worth $1.6 trillion. That's a fake. That's a fake number. That's fake news. But Amazon is worth a lot. You know why they're worth a lot? Because everyone shops on Amazon. You do your Amazon Prime. Your kids got Kindles. You got a Kindle. You get your book there. You get your groceries there. Everybody goes to Amazon Prime. So what I need you to do is tighten up, go to streetwarriorradio.com, click the Amazon click through, do your shopping, nothing else. Put your info in, check out, wait for your Amazon Prime delivery. That's it. It's that simple. That's what I need you to do. All right? Too easy. I also want to thank uh, Top Notch Tactics why I got your attention. Those guys' uh, info should be up on the website coming soon. Um... They're just a really good security company, veteran owned, police owned, um, great group of guys. Um, they're really making some headway out there. So be on the lookout for them for all your security needs. Topnotchtactics.com is where you can find them for right now. Um, like I said, their uh, their link will be up on our website soon. So um, make sure you go on Amazon click through. That's really all I need y'all to do. So uh, go ahead and relax. Big bow out. As we like to say, supporting great causes is not only a great way to help others and your community, it's also a great way to help yourself. Now, we here at the Street Warrior Radio Podcast encourage people to seek out great organizations that donate the majority of their profits or proceeds to the causes that they're actually trying to help. With that, I want you to take a look at a couple of organizations, Humanizing the Badge. Now, Humanizing the Badge is a nonprofit organization on a mission to help forge stronger relationships between law enforcement officers and the communities that they serve. They're engaging that mission through community service projects on a national level, providing free, confidential online support for first responders and their families that reach out to deal with the unique stresses of the job and engage on social media content through their pages and the pages of content creators that are part of their cause. And for example, Mike the Cop, Officer Daniels, Deputies Hook'em and Book'em, Deputy Misdemeanor, etc. Great organization. Please go over to humanizingthebadge.com, check them out, and if you're so inclined, please donate. Also, Guardian for Heroes. Guardian for Heroes is an organization that humbly and proudly carries the torch that Chris Kyle, the American Sniper, left and champion the cause to restore hope, renew spirits, and replenish energy for combat veterans transitioning to post-military life. At no cost to the beneficiary of the organization, Guardian for Heroes provides health club memberships, individualized programs, personal training, in-home fitness equipment, and life coaching to in-need veterans with disabilities, gold star families, and those suffering from post-traumatic stress from combat deployment. They use a variety of different physical and mental fitness techniques to spark conversation and create a support a source of support for combat veterans. This is an extremely important cause. Go over to guardianforheroes.org, check them out, and if you're so inclined, please donate. You can also go to the streetwarriorradio.com website, and on the left-hand side of every page, there's links to different organizations that we champion. Click on those, do your research. If you're comfortable, please give them a support. Also, if you have an organization that you support that we don't know about, you can contact us at streetwarriorradio.com slash contact or on that email at streetwarriorradio, I'm sorry, info at streetwarriorradio.com. Give us the information, a link to the organization and why you think we should know about them and support them. And we will definitely look into it and see what we can make happen. As always, streetwarriorradio.com.
This is Street Warrior Radio episode 014 with your hosts Big Bo and me, JC. On this episode, we welcome Mike the Cop. Mike is a social media juggernaut and podcaster whose always viral videos help show people a different side of law enforcement and through that, hopefully erase some of the stereotypes and falsehoods that are out there. Mike is a dedicated public servant and one of the primary factors behind Humanizing the Badge, a nonprofit organization aiming to help law enforcement and citizens come together. They also come to the aid of first responders and their families who are in need. You can learn more about them at humanizingthebadge.com. Mike, of course, can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube under the name Mike the Cop, as well as on iTunes and SoundCloud with his Off the Cuff podcast. Now, because Mike is a comedian in many respects, we wrestled with where to go with this episode. And we ultimately decided to show a different side of Mike that maybe most aren't familiar with. A look behind the persona you see online. We had a great interview and covered a variety of topics such as Mike's upbringing, law enforcement career, social media persona, and many other things. So sit back and prepare to go inside the mind of Mike the Cop on the Street Warrior Radio Podcast. Mike, welcome to the podcast. What's up? How are you doing today? Awesome as always. Sweet. Hey, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. We know you're a super busy guy. Thank you very much, sir. We do appreciate the time you've given us. And if you're ready, we'll just jump right into it. Hey, let's do it. Deep end. Right into the deep end. Right into the deep end. Let's talk about my my mommy and daddy issues. Let's get to it. Yes, that's actually my first question. Okay. (laughs) Mommy and daddy issues. Tell me about them. (laughs) I didn't know you had any. Um, So... For those of you, for the you know, there's like probably like four or five people out in the world that don't know who you are. Um, at least, at least, at least. But for those four or five people that that haven't figured it out yet, can you tell them where do you come from and what it was kind of like growing up for you? Uh, well, I was all over the place. I was born in Missouri, uh, which I do not remember, uh, but I am fond of, <laughs> of females nonetheless. And nice. I w- was oh in God. Texas for a brief period of time till I what was. Part? There. Uh, Wichita Falls. Oh, okay. Oh, All right. I don't know where sorry. that's at. Yeah, I, I guess. Me too. I don't know. I don't remember any of that. And then uh, yeah. Illinois for most of the early years beyond like six months until I was about five. And then we moved back to Metro Detroit, uh, Downriver Detroit, where uh, my dad grew up. We moved back here and I've been here since I was like six years old again. So, yeah. Cool. Awesome. That's pretty sweet. Um. What was your uh, what was your family dynamic like? Brothers, sisters? One brother. Oh, I know about your brother. Yeah. Yeah. One uh, real, real simple, actually. Just mom, dad, and me and my brother, and that was it. I, I mean, I come from a bigger family. My dad had uh, five siblings, so there was tons of cousins and and everything. That was just on my on my dad's side. Then we had my mom's side. So uh, overall, a big extended family. That's nice. So I, did y'all like get together for holidays and have big yeah, ho- holidays were a thing. Uh, Sunday dinner was like the main staple, right? So like we all went to different churches and whatever else, lived all in the area. And and then for those of us that didn't live out of state, it was everybody Sunday afternoon, like right after everybody got done with church, came there. It was like one o'clock or Sunday lunch and watched uh, WWE wrestling. And yes. <laughs> it was WWF then. And then uh, right, yes, yeah. watched wrestling. And then me and my cousins would go out and throw football or play wiffle ball or softball or go pretend to be wrestlers in the basement and beat each other up and cry and take a nap and yeah you know so uh why did you guys move around so much said you moved from state to state what was that about uh mostly with my with my dad's work at the time eventually he would do sort of like dual duty with different things but he was uh, a pastor of a church and did like youth work and so you know, when we were born in Missouri, then he got a he got a gig in Texas, and he didn't like it there. So then his next job was in Illinois, and that's where they just decided from there that uh, he was going to come back home and and do that here where he grew up. Okay. So cool. when y'all when y'all were moving around, did you did you, uh, did you go to public schools or did you do like a homeschool thing or co ops or? Well, like I, I, I was I got here when I was six. I, I mean, I literally started kindergarten here. So it's oh, okay, okay. So yeah. for for me, I, I remember living in Illinois, and we. My parents had some close friends there, so 
we went back there a lot in the summertime for va- family okay. vacations uh, to visit right. them. And I actually, one of the guys that like stood up in my wedding, you know, was a kid that I just like hung out with every summer when we would go on vacation and they would come here and that kind of a thing. So, I mean, we still had people we knew and connected to, you know, back, uh, back in Illinois, probably, well, I'm probably still Facebook friends with some of them or something, you know, I don't know, but, uh, right, cool. <laughs> but yeah, so pretty much my whole life has been pretty much here in Metro Detroit. So what, what kind of, what kind of student were you? Uh, I don't know. I think I was good. Yeah. I probably, t- yeah, I, I did, I did decent. Like, I think I graduated like a three seven or something like that. Oh, that's, wow. That's, that's, that's really good. More than decent for most people. Right. <laughs> were you, were you, were you, uh, were you, had you kind of developed the, uh, the, the, the goofy persona like in school Were you ever like class clown or anything or was it? No, man. More introverted? I, uh, I grew up. Uh, in, I did sometimes private school, uh, sometimes public, but you know, I, I went from a private, a private, uh, Christian school in junior high, uh, of a total student body of maybe like, you know, 200 into, uh, a school of, you know, 1200 in a public school environment. And it was like shell shock, you know, when I was like in high school. So I was pretty, I had a good group of friends, you know, that we, uh, that, you know, I got to know, but it was, I, I, I pretty shy until like probably like my junior and senior year of high school. But then I, I would think like by that point, uh, I was, I was pretty outgoing. I've always been, I think goofy, I guess, but sure. <laughs> so, always- uh, what, in- what inspired you to get into law enforcement? Man, I, uh, it was one of those things where uh, my, my uncle actually was a reserve officer and I, he had a police police scanner at home, and I remember being a kid listening to that and just being <laughs> being fascinated by it. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, and then one of the first jobs that I got, uh, just because you know when you need work, you need work, ended up being in in loss prevention at uh, like a department type store. Yeah, okay. And uh, and then I got exposure to to meeting meeting cops that way, and some of the guys that I was working with to this day, I, I'm I'm friends with them, and they're they're in law enforcement, uh, and we work together all, you know, at this store, you know, catching shoplifters. And I just remember like tackling shoplifters and fighting and being like, this is the coolest. Can I swear here? Or like, yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was like, man, this is the coolest shit ever. You know, like, this is like, this is amazing. And that's what I think really sparked it for me. Like outsmarting the bad guy and, yeah. and catching the bad guy, man. Like I, I just kind of fell in love with it there. And obviously I didn't, that was back in like, I think late nineties, I got that gig. And then I did that for a few years and I don't know, family stuff. I was married young and having kids and there were so many things, you know, kind of happening in the way that going to the police academy and paying my way through or trying to get a job and making that change wasn't, wasn't the top priority for a while. So it just was something that always stuck with me. And finally uh, I kind of looked at my savings account and I was like, I have enough right now to put myself to the police academy and live for six months. So I might as well do it now. That's pretty cool. So what was the police academy like for you? Uh, dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Elaborate. Please elaborate for our listeners. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It was good. You know, like you meet good, you meet cool people and, and then you realize like, uh, there's a lot of morons too. And it, it's, it is what mine, it is, but it, it was mine fun. was Mine was high school part two. Yeah. That's what was, mine was. I think it helped that I was a little bit older. I was, I was 30, I can't remember. Was I 32 or 33 when I went through? I, I don't remember, but uh, 33, I think. And, you know, so I think that I kind of like, I didn't get involved in being an idiot, you know, and yeah. whatever. So I, I, I enjoyed it though. I mean, I, I enjoyed the learning process, learning the law and, um, you know, the, the structure of it. It was very, par- my academy compared to others in the area was, uh, very paramilitary. So I, I enjoyed yeah. the structure yeah. of that and, and I liked it, but, um, it it wasn't it wasn't hard you know like okay. if 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 you are not an idiot you should be able to breeze through should should, <laughs> should be able, able to yes. should yeah, yeah. should Keep so uh, was there ever a point where you thought or doubted yourself or wanted to quit uh, and if so what changed your mind no I didn't want to quit no I was I was bound and determined to get a job as a cop and 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 work there so I never had like moments of self doubt I had moments of irritation where you know some dumbass forgot his flashlight and we got to sign like a nine page, nine point font paper for the, do the next day or something stupid. But you know, <laughs> That's um, annoying. 
yeah. So, I mean, there is moments like that of just being like, this is so dumb, you know, like so you, waking up at five gonna... in the morning and going to bed at 11 at night and, you know, doing that for four months straight. It's... In our, yeah, if, in ours, if somebody messed up, we got like punished with PT. Yeah, we did that too. Yeah. The PT instructor, though, would assign papers and it was dumb. <laughs> God, yeah, that's horrible. Yeah. Y'all fuckers gonna have to write too. They're like, yeah, why can't we just kick this guy's ass? You know, like, why <laughs> yeah. can't we just like yeah. fight him, him or something? And then be next party. He's probably gonna learn more from that anyway. Just yeah, yeah exactly. Just you want to know how to teach people to remember their flashlight? Beat them with a flashlight. With and the then flashlight, they're, they're gonna remember. Repeatedly. I should probably bring that next time. <laughs> they will never forget class. it again, ever. I promise. <laughs> exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's so true. Um, so <laughs> what a. Uh, when you got out of the police academy and you were you were done with that nonsense, um, what uh what was your first day as a brand new shiny badged cop like on the street? <laughs> I uh I went from bad to worse. Uh, oh, I actually, wow! <laughs> I love my I love my first department actually. Uh, but I love the people I work with. It turns out that uh, politically it was there's just a bunch of liars. But uh, mm, yeah. we can get to that story later. But sure. it, it was. Uh, it was awesome, but a very, very old school, and we worked in a you know a pretty urban area, and it was very like what you would think almost from the movies where the new guy is treated like absolute shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that that's exactly what it was, and when when I was on FTO, like they had very strict rules for their FTO, like uh, there was no fraternizing. At that department, you couldn't. I couldn't even go hang out at a ball game. Nothing until after probation. So it was a whole. That's, year. How, it was, that's how it was. In my, well, mine wasn't probation, but it was f- during field training. There yeah, was during zero. field training, that's common. But uh, yeah, yeah, this that extended for a year. Jeez. I couldn't wow, hang out. That's, and that's uh, crazy. so when you packed your lunch, we had like uh, a kitchen area, and then we had like the roll call room. Well, everybody like you know would get lunch and sit down, and they would eat in the roll call room because there was more space. I had to still sit in the kitchen and that was like even on Sunday. So we worked 12 hour shifts. So you worked Jeez. every other Sunday. So on the big meal day, everybody chipped in, whether you went and bought something or whether everybody brought something from home, like they got to go sit down. Like your FTO would leave you to go eat and you had to eat by yourself <laughs> at the little you, kid's table. You were not allowed to speak in roll call. You were not allowed to speak to any officer unless spoken to. I mean, you don't exist yet. Exactly. You oh, earn wow. your, you earn your spot. And then like, uh, you know, then some of the older guys, like there'd be a, there was a guy like in records that had already worked and retired and came back to work in records or something. And he was like, yeah, back in my day, they used to like, your shoes would come shined and then they would spit on them and then scuff them up for you and tell you like your <laughs> shoes are, and make you do push ups and stuff. Like even when you're already on the job, like what That's the heck? Awesome. <laughs> we did have, we did have roll call every Sunday where it was like, you had to stand in formation and like all that stuff. And, you know, it was a, it was a formality cause it was like tradition. I mean, once you got once you once you showed you weren't a turd and you could do the job, then you're kind of like welcome. You, but you had to earn your spot, you know. And and, so. and and people say the police are militarized now, right? Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you know, it's it's fun. Do you do you think there's like do you do you think there is some benefit though to because um, I know everything probably for the most part across the country, everyone's you know when people a new employee comes in and they're going through training and stuff. It's there's some places where it's like well you can't call them a rookie. <laughs> they 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 they're your partner, or you have to address them as trainee officer no, or whatever. Not. Yeah, no. I mean, but but it, it, we kind of we kind of coddle, and especially with this new generation. But um, although there are some smart millennials out there, I'll throw it, I'll throw that out there. But 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 for the most part, that kind of caters to that personality type yeah. archetype. But uh, do you think there's some benefits though to that kind of hazing and kind of earning your spot and earning your place? Do you feel like I don't know? I felt like back because like when I started, it wasn't that it wasn't like that um the what your experience was but it was close but i felt like i mean i put my head down and shut up and was like i expected that and then yeah. i felt like when i got to that point where it was like okay now hey now you're a brother now you're part of it you know yeah i felt more of a sense of accomplishment on top of everything else and i felt like wow i earned my spot here do you feel like there's like yeah. some benefit to that but yeah, I, I, I 100 not uh, to all the degrees. I feel there's a benefit to that. Yeah, like <laughs> okay, all right. to, to me, like I, I, I don't add. I, I don't think treating people poorly is necessarily like uh, the best tactic. But making people earn their spot 
For sure. And, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, being disciplined with it. You know, I, I don't think that I would go as far as like saying like that, like I had to go through, which is like you can't even socialize for a year. I don't think yeah, that I would go lot. that far. Yeah. So but, that's a long I mean, time. Yeah. So because by the time you go through the academy and get through FTO and do that, I mean, what? I can't socialize with cops for a year and a half after I've been doing this. You know, like <laughs> right, yeah. that doesn't make it that that part doesn't make much sense. But the part about um just making people earn their spot, especially after coming out of the academy, when when there's that moment where you think the academy has prepared you and then you realize all it did was make it to where I don't die like the first day, you know, like uh, yeah, it's yeah, like it's important. That's that's it. Like that's so I think there's a huge value in that. And I found like as a training officer, once I was in that position, like being making giving that idea i i enjoyed having that reputation like oh you have him good luck right you know you gotta yeah. get, you gotta get through him if he passes you through phase three or you know whatever if you're getting through shadow with him you know you made it you know like i think sure. i think if you have a reputation in your training department like that like hey if you can pass the fco here man you're you're gonna make it because then yeah. when they do that gives them a sense of accomplishment and confidence that yeah i'm part of this and and that leads to pride in the department. You know, I agree. Oh, sure. yeah. And I totally agree with that. And we, you know, we've we've interviewed some people in the special operations community in the military. And you find that, um, you know, with them, they they those guys go through a brutal hazing ritual. Oh, like yeah. their first. I mean, all the way through their first deployment. They're not even considered part of the group, really, until after their first combat deployment. And you look at that and but when they get through with it and they really like it really solidifies that 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 family feeling and that brotherhood oh, and yeah. the camaraderie right. uh, there's just something about it in that type of structure and even in law enforcement structure being quote unquote, you know paramilitary or whatever um i, th I think there's it's, it's great it's really important i think yeah for I for agree. an officer's development yeah um so who's been the biggest influence on your life and um, how has that person influenced you? Man, that's a, there's so many <laughs> and there, and there's so many aspects to my life. Um, oh, wow. uh, I, I don't know. It's, that's, that's a really, it's actually a really hard question to answer. I have, I, I've been blessed with a lot of people that have, that have really been huge impacts in, in my life. Um, I mean, I, I, I would certainly say that I owe pretty much everything that I am to my dad and what the, and the ethics that he instilled in me, uh, all the way around. I think I, I think I'd miss a good chance to, to give, give him the credit he deserves as, as a parent and a person. If yeah, I didn't awesome. say him, I guess probably like, uh, I, but I, honestly, man, I've been super fortunate to have a lot of super, uh, positive people that have, you know, I, I just wouldn't be doing what I'm doing or where I, I just literally, I'd be like in a strip club, uh, passed out on the sidewalk. <laughs> I, I, it's like, that's, that's where I'd be. I'd, I'd have nothing going for me. Uh, but I, you know, I certainly have been, been very fortunate with the people in my life. That's good. That's man. awesome. That's awesome. Be blessed like that. So, um, what's the, what's the weirdest thing you've ever experienced while on patrol? Like the weirdest story you have. <laughs> oh man weird weirdness and children uh, don't children don't listen to this podcast so please <laughs> please proceed i man i uh, I'm, I'm terrible i don't want to disappoint with uh with <laughs> the uh, when you say like things like what's your favorite movie or favorite song or band? oh no I'm yeah like, i I'm piss everybody with off that with that stuff, yeah so me too like, I, i'm not so good like i usually have like floating top fives yeah that's a, yeah um, i'm exactly the same way on that but uh i mean weird weird stuff like crazy stuff more i've never had anything like bizarre in terms of like uh like a paranormal or a weirdness like that but uh i've certainly seen and dealt with a plenty of uh usually it's the the mental side of things like uh i spent probably an hour on a call once until i i really believed that this lady had someone break into her house <laughs> until it, I, I let a lot of time go by until I like I she had me fooled. That's how crazy she was. <laughs> but so she was like showing me in her room 
and it was it was it was to- like there was a there was a a drawer pulled out there was jewelry on the floor right oh, wow. like she's like uh they stole this set of jewelry and i'm like and certain things weren't quite adding up i mean i was asking the questions like well why didn't they take all the jewelry i could fit this in my hand <laughs> like why she's like i don't know they just wanted this one thing blah 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 i'm like I was like, okay. So we go through all this stuff that's missing and, and things are just off. And then like, it was like, okay, where did they get into the house from? She's like, oh, and completely like this was normal to her. She's like, oh, they came through the portal. Oh. oh. And I was like, okay. oh, the portal. Yeah. Right. No, it makes total sense. Uh, yeah. Could you show me the portal? And I swear to you, she walks me up these steps and then she's pointing to a wall and she's like, yeah, it's right here. <laughs> and I'm like, this is where they came through? She's like, well, that's the only way in when the doors are locked. Well, clearly, portal. clearly, Mike. Oh, well, I'm like, yeah, well, aren't I an idiot for not, idiot for not knowing that obviously you have to go through the portal obviously. when the doors are locked. Where, the, where uh, else are you going to come Where from? does this uh, portal end up at? That's what I want to know. <laughs> so usually I catch on to that really quick and I try to have fun with them. Like I would tell them like some lady was talking about uh, creatures in her uh, her air ducts or something like that and yes, uh, in their one of my part one of my partners had to leave because i was making him laugh so hard i was telling him like <laughs> oh it's a- that's the chupa that's the chupa ferret you know like the chupacabra but the chupa ferret tinier you know like it's in the ducts and all you have to do is hang hang cloves of garlic around on the ceiling and you know and then they go away after a little while they migrated down here and that's the only way to get rid of them there's like stupid stuff like that i try to just <laughs> have fun while you're there with the weird people oh and, god uh, and we had where I where I worked most recently full time, it's like uh, ground zero for mental health. Literally, like three mental health facilities there. Wow! So there are people who are out of their ever loving minds are walking around everywhere. Oh, jeez! And <laughs> so it's it was a daily thing. Like that that story was like I don't know, just a really commonplace thing to happen. So so you you bring up the chupacabra, right? So I actually had a call one time about a chupacabra sighting <laughs> and just think about the type of person that would call something like that in i would totally just call think about in. the stereotype of that and that's right. that's the person i met i mean literally i show up and first of all i'm like why am i here right now and this dude pulls up in this truck and he's like you never gonna believe what i saw there was this alien creature and he just keeps going on you're just like oh my god i just met hillbilly joe and he's telling me about the chupacabra he saw. And I had to search for this stupid thing because he was so convinced that he saw it. And I'm like, I can't believe it. I, you know, this is, because, this is where, I've, this is where my career's gone. Because is he did. Because he did. He probably did. He probably this did. This is what I've become. This yeah. is what I've become. This is the point I've reached. Oh All right. On a little serious note, um, uh, how do you cope with the darkness when you encounter it on the job? Um, I feel like um, I've, I've had a lot of time to think about that and – frame sort of like i don't want to say it's a canned answer because it's it's honest and i i I bring it i break it down for me in terms of i think three sort of key areas that i i try to keep focused on Mm -hmm. yeah uh the first would be uh faith only because everybody what we all share in common is is the same questions of you know who am i why am i here sure what's wrong What's wrong with this world <laughs> like, right. and and how are we supposed to fix it? So everybody, I think, can at least agree that we all see the world through a particular set of uh, answers to those questions because we all ask them and we all have a default answer to that. You know, Maybe it's a shitty one. Maybe it's a good one, but we all have an answer to it yeah. that we basically base our entire lives off of. So whether we whether we actually take time to think about it or not, we have like a default switch based on a lot of circumstances in our lives growing up that we see the world a certain way. So for me, I have like this grid of faith, the way that I see the world through. And that is my, my primary coping mechanism is seeing the world through that lens and trying to keep everything in perspective that way, understanding tragedy and, and all of the, the brokenness and humanity. I see it through that particular lens and, that's sort of how I keep grounded with that. And we've – with uh, our Humanized Nevada organization, we've, mm-hmm. we've seen that uh, in, in studies that we've conducted like uh, surveys and stuff 
that it's it's a massive increase in people who feel less impacted by the stress of the job if they're actively participating in some type of faith activity. Sure, and wow. we don't we don't even break that down by like you know denomination or particular religion. Just if you believe in something you know bigger than yourself that life is about, that helps. So that that for me is is number one. Uh, my family is obviously number two, uh, where. Um, you know, their, their support, those relationships, you know, time with your kids and family, uh, that, that makes a, a huge difference is to, you know, maintain this being a, a normal life, you know, where the kids are playing sports and yeah, absolutely. You know, sure. you're hanging out and, and making sure that, and I think it's been important to, I, I don't tell, I don't tell my wife or kids everything, but I also uh, try not to keep everything away from them either. And they've been, ex- been exposed to that. Um, they've been exposed to the full law enforcement family experience and, right. uh, and they, you know, it just keeping it open and honest and, and support. And it's, and it's helped my family life too, because I will never leave to go on patrol without even, even my oldest kids, uh, two of which don't even live in the house. But if they were here, my six, most 16 year old kids aren't going to give their dad a hug and a kiss and say, I love you and be safe. Yeah. Right. right. So like, that is something that happens in my family, and um, I'm really I, that just keeps me grounded, right? So family, family is important, and that's how I I think that makes me empathetic when I'm on the job mm-hmm. at the right times, and also keeps me motivated uh, to not be empathetic and to break someone's face if I need to to come back to that family. You know, like sure. it's it, it gets both ways, and then uh, I think just fun, man. I, I have fun in life, that, like. I do my social media stuff. I go to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, I drink whiskey. Uh, I I play video games. I have fun. So, <laughs> like, uh, I blow off steam, and I have friends that aren't cops. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I think that's, that's important. That's you have important. to have you have to have a, a healthy mix of friendships. Yep. What's your uh, yeah? For what's sure. What's your favorite uh, whiskey? I've been on a on a bourbon kick lately, and Bullet Bourbon has been like my real my real big go to. Okay. So I, I've been uh, I've been enjoying that. Now I'm like I kind of started with the Irish whiskeys, yes. then I dabbled in scotches, then I moved on to bourbons, which I have been by far my favorite. And then uh, I really want to try brandy next and kind of experiment with that a little bit. E and J, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 so um, no, I think you're right though. I, you know, when it comes to the family stuff, I don't think you can shut your family out completely. Because I think the the family has to have some sort of base level understanding of what it is that you go through. Because honestly, it's been my experience that you know dealing with um, everything from from PTS to just simple simple things that bother you, you know, or stresses, or and they don't even have to be things you've encountered on the on the street. They could be some BS right. inside the department or whatever. Um, yeah, communication for me is obviously the number one thing you have to be able to communicate and verbalize what it is that you're you're experiencing but like especially with your spouse i mean you can't you don't want to tell them like everything now some people are are in different situations where they have a spouse that's in law enforcement so maybe you can be a little more open because they they understand the dynamics of it um yeah but i mean if you shut if i think if you shut your family completely out you you end up running into problems later on because they don't know how to react to how you're feeling you might be moody for for whatever reason you may not even know why it may be right. on a subconscious level and it may be from something that happened on the job and they're just like oh god he's being a dick you know and it can and it can just right. lead to it can lead to these little these little pockets of, of of frustration that build up over time and i think if there's that understanding there i think it's super important um yeah for sure but there's definitely been times where like we would go out with guys from work or whatever and you know our our spouses or whatever are with us and they're like she'd be like oh you never told me that this happened like so and so said that you guys went on this call and this happened i was like oh yeah i forgot about that yeah, <laughs> right <laughs> my bad babe so um yeah. how how is your your career thus far as a police officer how how has it shaped you um personally uh i i mean it, it ch- i think it changes you you know yeah, well, of i course, mean yeah i i don't uh yeah, I mean the way I guess the way that I see the world is is a little bit different because of that, you know. And w- you get to see a spot that most people don't get to see. <laughs> like oh yeah, uh, for sure. Uh and 
I mean, imagine going over to your friend's house, obviously, like at the at the worst moments of their lives, at the, the worst parts of their lives. And that's like what we go to from thing to thing to thing. Right, and, yep. you know, it's, it's like it changes you in that respect. And it's hard to remind yourself like, hey, there's a whole world out here that like normal people live in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's changed me to hopefully recognize that there is, there is this side of the world and that good people are there keeping it at bay. But. You know, it helps you appreciate the rest of normal life too. Sure. So I think, you know, it's probably it's changed. It's probably uh, maybe it hasn't changed me as much as it's really like stuck me into who I am. Right. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, like, it totally makes sense. Uh, it 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 takes my good qualities and makes them better, and it and it makes my bad qualities really noticeable too. Sure. <laughs> right. Probably. Yeah. I you know I've I've kind of learned that appreciating the. Uh, the small moments in your life, like simple things like the, your, your dog jumping up and licking your face or, you know, your, right. your kid doing something that they, you know, would, would normally just be like, you know, no big deal or whatever, but just something that they think is a big deal. And you just look at them and you're like, wow. You know, I mean, I just, so there's certain, cause you see so much sometimes and it's like, you see these, right. you see these little moments of happiness. And I just, for me, it like, it makes, I just appreciate those things a lot more. Yeah. You know, but um, so now in being a police officer, we often learn things about ourselves, um, that maybe we didn't, we didn't know before, but what is, what is kind of the most impactful thing you've learned about yourself, um, both positively and negatively from your experiences in law enforcement? Uh, probably that I'm more resilient than I would have thought I was, but I'm also no better than anybody else. Mm, right. Yeah. Uh, I like that last part. I think like there's really not a lot – there's not a lot that stands between me and, and a lot of people that I've put in jail other than just, you know, grace. And choices. <laughs> so, choices. It comes, yeah. I mean it's, life is about choices, you know, I, I think. Oh, for sure. So I think being able to to see uh, to see myself in some of the people that I've dealt with is, is a good – Sure. I think it's a good thing, you know, and uh, and to be able to – yeah, be thankful for those choices, or to, or to let, or to let what you see help you make even you know different choices, right? In, in your life, you know. So yeah, I mean, I've I've met people I've taken to jail that by the time we get there, we're like best friends almost because of, at least in that moment, <laughs> yeah. because sometimes you learn stuff about people, and and I don't I don't know that the the broad public under, really kind of understands this, um, you know. We, we, you know, we don't like just going out and just throwing people in jail. Right? No, for sure. We, we actually right. relate to the, we, you hear these stories and sometimes you're like, that's me. This person oh, yeah. is me. Right. This person is like, we had this like similar backgrounds and, and, and they just, they went this way and I went that way. And that's all it was. It was, it was a choice, but my wife cheated on me and I flattened right. all her tires. Well, okay. You yeah, probably I mean, shouldn't have done that, but <laughs> you know, I mean, I get it. I get, <laughs> I get it. it. I but, get you where know. you're going, bud. Um, so this is kind of a weird question, but, um, if present day Mike could travel forward in time and meet the 90 year old Mike, what would you tell him? <laughs> wow. If my present day self could go to the 90 year old yep, self and have a conversation with him, what would you say? Be like, I'd yell at my 90 year old self for not <laughs> me, not saving more money now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, I don't know. I'd, I'd probably just shut my mouth and listen to 90-year-old self because he better have a lot more wisdom than me. You would think so, right? <laughs> don't drink yeah. the E&J. That's what he's going to say. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. All right, so the flip side of that, if you could go back in time and talk to the 20-year-old version of yourself, what advice would you give him? Oh, man. Uh, don't get a credit card. <laughs> uh, God, isn't that the truth? <laughs> exercise. Uh, I don't know. Like, I think... I think um, those would be some of the some of the key things like slow down and uh, I, I think thinking about what you really wanted life to be. I'm, I'm a big fan of sort of like coming coming up with what is it that you're looking to accomplish and then thinking like reverse engineering it and saying uh, what is the next best step then to get to where you want to go. And I, I think like my younger self – didn't have a real clear picture of where I I wanted to go. Right. You know, start so with the. End I would have just mind. encouraged my younger self, "Hey, why don't you just take a couple of days and really, really think about 
where you want to be. Like, what is it that you want your life to be about? That way, you know, the next best step to take best step to take. And, uh, and I, I just spent a lot of my time spinning a lot of plates, you know, in my twenties and which I learned a lot, sure, from, absolutely. obviously, but I mean, you know, it could have been further down the field earlier, you know, yeah, with, I, with just, yeah. Just as much enjoyment in oh, life. Yeah, I feel sure. the same way. I, yeah, I feel the. I think every I think every man goes through that. Like God, if I'd have just done this different in my twenties, like <laughs> not <laughs> yeah, been absolutely. eating spoonfuls of butter. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> how did the social media persona begin? Tell us how Mike the Cop started. So, uh, I started writing. Actually, I, I put a little website and Facebook page together back in like the spring of 2014. So ah, four years ago now, um, and I called it Cop Life. So I did coplife.net, had a website with a blog on it, put a Facebook page up. That's all I knew, and I was just writing. I wasn't even doing video sure. at all, just putting down some of my thoughts and experiences to paper. Yeah. Uh, that led to you know a, a little miniature network of relationships of people who had, who had read my stuff, and then um, one such person – stood out to me uh her name's tristy she goes by elizabeth uh on social media but also her real name so it's confusing i think she's <laughs> got multiple personalities uh, she's, she's but she us. wrote she wrote something called dear officer and i saw that and i read it and i reached out to her and said hey do you mind if i share this and give you credit on my blog i don't want it you know if you don't want me to i get it but i want to want more, more people to right. see this so she's like yeah, as long as I could share you what you wrote about this. I'm like, yeah, cool. You know, no problem. You can always share anything you want of mine. I don't care. And uh, that led to a conversation between us got, getting to know one another. And she sort of had this idea in her head at the time of starting some type of organization to put uh, the battle for, you know, the perception of law enforcement and social media, you know, try to try to fight the good fight there. And that ultimately led to humanizing the badge. And we had no clue what we were doing. We were just like, let's just make a Facebook page. And, you know, like, I don't know, like say cool stuff. Sure. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know. We, neither one of us really knew well, what we were doing. We just knew we wanted to do something. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, for me, that catalyst was Ferguson. Cause I was like this, the way the, the way the media handled that, I was like, man, somebody has got to get in the game and start like fighting back. Um, so, we were doing humanizing the badge and we were like, I don't know, almost a year in and I had seen this officer Daniels guy, just like, uh, Eric or, uh, deputy Hookham had told you on, on his episode with yeah. you guys, like he saw officer Daniels on Vine. Right. And so my kids were watching Daniels on Vine and then the guys at work were starting to see it. And I was like, Oh man, this is crazy that a cop, is getting this kind of attention. Oh yeah, you know? people love him. So, yeah, our uh, our thought. We had this meeting and uh, with me and and Tristy, and we were talking, and I was like, "Well, video seems to be the thing that's sort of like happening right now, you know. So maybe I could try that as a way to continue to grow, humanizing the badge. So I I think I can't remember what the very first video I did was, but I remember the very first one that I did that got any attention it was my son-in-law actually, who, who would become my son-in-law. I had him in the back of the cop car and, uh, and did this little talk like a, a pilot. Like yeah, a yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. Said, no. like, sit back on the, it was a vine. So six seconds. And it was like, sit back on the hard plastic seats and enjoy right. the ride. And I was like, and I put it on Facebook and I woke up the next morning and it had like, you know, a million views or something Jesus. stupid. I was like, yeah, what, what the, the hell? I was like, that's crazy. And from that moment on, I just like, oh, I'll just kind of like roll with the next idea and roll with the next idea. And then all of a sudden, like something took off on Vine. And I was like, huh, I guess I can do this. And it was my way of like humanizing the badge. Sure. Like that was all it was. It was like I wanted to encourage cops and I wanted to show non-cops that – we are just people with a sense of humor, you know, like we can laugh at ourselves and we can laugh at the circumstances we find ourselves in and we can laugh at you. <laughs> right. You're of course. Uh, you know, like, uh, so I, I kind of like, and I've never, the difference, one of the differences, obviously, like I've always just been myself. Mike, the cop's not a character. Yeah. Like, it's you. Yeah. I'm, I'm just that's me. Cool, it's like, that's it. And, uh, and I just kept doing it because once people started saying, 
oh, we watched this in roll call or, man, we had a really terrible shift. So we all kind of like gathered around and somebody showed us your videos and it made us laugh. And I was like, man, that's what it's all about. Like, I really like knowing that this is I'm having fun and I'm doing something that I feel like is giving back into the, the law enforcement sure. community in in good ways. Like I'm not I'm not asking something from the community. I, I'm just offering it up and it feels good. Like I make my videos and you don't have to give me anything in return. You can watch it or you right. can not yeah, watch yeah, exactly. it. But I'm putting I'm putting it out yeah. there, you know? Yeah. It's just like it's just like with this podcast. I mean, man, we've gotten the some of the re- people that have replied or made comments or whatever. I mean, regular pe- regular people that have been like, wow, you know, we started listening to the podcast and man, it's just, we have a whole different view of cops. It's, you guys are super entertaining. You know, I mean, they love it. I mean, and, and it means, it means a ton to us. You know what I mean? It means yeah. a ton to us to get that kind of feedback because that, I mean, and we're not reinventing the wheel here on the podcast. We're essentially trying to do the exact same thing that all of you guys have been doing in social media. And that's right. just, Hey, listen, aside from the career that we've, we've been called to, we're just people. That's it. And, and when we go through yeah. the same shit that everybody else does, we laugh, we cry, we hurt, you know, and, 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 and I, I think it's, it's been awesome for all of you guys that, that, that do everything on, that you do on social media and especially through humor. Cause I think humor is one of the, the best avenues for getting a message across and getting people to relate to you. Um, our podcast yeah. is, is a little more serious, um, most of the time, but, um, it's just an amazing connection and, and yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's so important nowadays. And you mentioned Ferguson, especially since Ferguson, especially since the way the media spun it and handled it, politicians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's just been right. this snowball effect with how cops are viewed, treated, et cetera. And it's important. I think it's super important to have that kind of light in the world yeah. where you say, hey, yeah. listen, yeah, we're sure. just, we're just here. We're, we're part of you guys. And yep. It's important to show people that. I think that's awesome that you've been able to accomplish what you have. Yeah, I, I don't know what the ceiling is. I'm just gonna kind of keep keep yeah. plugging away. The <laughs> ceiling is the thing. sky. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, have you? Uh, did you face any professional backlash for doing your social media? Like, what was your response from fellow law enforcement, or just you know from your department, if you can speak on it? Yeah, I can. Uh, the <laughs> Uh, I'll fast forward. I'm gonna I'm gonna Quentin Tarantino okay. this for you because <laughs> the department that I the department that I no longer work at, um, where I got my start in social media, they actually just came out with a policy that literally names me by name as Mike the Cop and their inability to participate in my wow. videos, you know, oh, with uh, any form of representation in uniform. Congratulations, at all. man! Most so, people, job, man. most people get a policy after them, but not too many can get name dropped in a policy. My hats are off. I to know, you, sir. I know. That's amazing. Uh, when I <laughs> when I when I heard about it, I was like, "Is my actual name in it?" He's like, "Yes," and it was like, "It's in there." I'm like, "Oh my goodness, this is amazing! It's the greatest day of my life." Um, and and then right after, I went to YouTube and did a video on why police administrations in cities need to get a clue about right. social media because they're being they're being idiots. They're shooting themselves in the proverbial oh, yeah, sure. foot by by trying to close off social media because it's so it's so dumb to trust somebody with a, a gun and life or death decisions, but not with posting a selfie on Facebook. It's the most uh, ridiculous right. thing I've ever heard. So. Uh, and I get the the mentality is yeah, but they could say something that comes back on the department. They could do something on social. Yeah, they could do that in their regular life, just like you've trusted right. them for decades. You know, like yeah, yeah. like it's not it's not a fake life, idiots. Like, yeah, we're, life. Yeah, we're not so, barn like, trash. We're not we're not robots that get plugged into the wall at the end yeah. of the day. You know, exactly. So I'm a, I'm a big toward toward the very end of my career. Actually, one of the one of the higher ups said, uh, asked me point blank, like if I, if we told you you couldn't do social media anymore what would you do i said i'd make a video i would name i would name you and i would say that you didn't want me to do social media anymore (laughs) he's like you you would do that i'm like i 100 percent know that i would i guarantee it and i'd walk out the door it's fine like i don't i don't and it it was a good feeling to not be in the position to need that anymore um but be nice (laughs) um so yeah i uh i was since they already knew about the organization humanizing the badge I, I went in I, – man, I poured over the social media policy uh, time and time again. I looked at that, and then 
I looked at like secondary employment stuff. I, I covered every angle right. that I could. And then I sort of put together a pitch in an email and went to the back office and said, listen, I want to do videos. Here's my motivation for doing it. My motivation is to help this organization that I started. It's not, it's a nonprofit. I, I'm not, there's nothing in this for me personally, directly, as far as like making money. I just want to go and do this and see if it's something that will, will be good. And they're like, all right, cool. They gave me sort of like a little bit of slack. Like we know that we know that you do HTB, so we'll see how it goes. And there were, there were moments where they're like, oh, we need to, like, I got in trouble for wearing a kilt outside of a high school and filming. Oh and, uh, they, I got called on while I was a cop, uh, for a, a male in a skirt harassing children. Oh my God. So, uh, <laughs> so there's, I mean, I pushed the envelope, believe me. Uh, but, um, what, what the big turning point was is that we don't have, we didn't have school resource officers, but I spent every morning that I could on day shift in a school and I would adopt a school for a semester and go in there and hang out with the kids. And that helped keep me sort of like fresh on social sure. media, I think. And, um, I was walking through the hallway one day at the department and one of the big bosses was like, Hey, I saw, saw one of your videos. And I'm like, Oh, here we go. <laughs> and his kids, uh, were laughing in another room and he went in to see what they were laughing at and they pointed to this video and he was like, Hey, that guy works for me. <laughs> like that's my, that's your video. And I, he's like, so whatever it is that you're doing, keep it up. And I'm like, Oh, cool. So then I got a lot more slack in the line. And from that point on, pretty much, I never really had any issues. I kind of just, eventually I started like just fully just saying whatever the crap I wanted. Like there's only two genders or something. Like I would say, like, I just say it, you know, like, and I would mock culture and I would do whatever I wanted. And, um, I was never on the clock when I did it. So I, I mean, I, I tried to be really careful about how, how I did it and to honor, honor the, uh, the space that they gave me. And it wasn't, it wasn't until recently after I didn't even work there anymore that a couple of the guys, we, there was a new city administrator and he flipped his lid and he hates me and all this other stuff and blah, 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 that I, I'm trying to help the guys that are there to not, you know, not get uh, undue pressure right, on them. Yeah. So, but, so are you, are you yeah. still, are you still an uh, active uh, cop at the moment or? Yes, technically. technically uh, <laughs> I, I stopped full-time work at, uh, July last year, I got a part-time gig and I just actually, I still have like technically a badge and an ID and a gun right now, but, uh, I just resigned yesterday because, um, that department has lost a lot of part-time people. So they're expecting a lot more hours mm, gotcha. and there is, they're just too much more than I can give. So I, I don't have a, I'm at a point to where like working a couple times a month to keep my certification, to stay fresh, to, you know, to do that and serve in a community is fun for me and it, and I, I enjoy it, but I, I just, I'm so busy with what I have going organizationally and in some other businesses that I have that at this point, it's like I have to kind of make a choice about how will I actually best be able to continue to do good work in the law enforcement community. And if stepping away from patrol in order to do more things that would have a bigger positive impact, you know, like on whether it's suicide prevention and awareness or whatever it is that I'm doing, right. I have to kind of weigh it all out and say, I, hopefully I could have a longer lasting impact on the community doing what I'm doing with that kind of freedom versus being stuck at like, oh, I've got to work eight, eight, eight shifts this month instead of sure. two. Yeah, absolutely. And so now, now I just lost a week of my life that I can't, can't do that yeah. with. Um, so when when it kind of when when all this kind of blew up right when 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 everything started to get to the point where it was like wow I could really do this full time um was that kind of was it like a change in mission for you or did you just it just became like hey I've got to I've got to step back a little bit from the from working full time in law enforcement to devote my time to this or was I know cuz some cops you know they reach like I know so many that have reached like that kind of midpoint in their career and they're just like mm -hmm. kind of burned out, right? And they're just like yeah, looking yeah. for guys or something else maybe I should be doing. Um, yeah. Was it kind of like that for you or was it just kind of like? No, for me, the transition, like I, I don't know what would have happened if I would have just always worked. I, I was in a really kind of crazy spot because we were like 10 guys short at the department right. and – I was working insane amounts of overtime, order, like both voluntary and mm -hmm. ordered. 
I've and done that before. you know, be, between that and all of the social media, and we tra- I was traveling a lot with Humanizing the Badge for projects and stuff like right. that, and and then I had my own social media stuff that I was doing as you know Mike the Cop and all this, and it, I just came to a point one day where I was like, I don't. I told my wife I was like, I don't remember the last time I had a day off, and she was like, I don't either, mm. and it was kind of like a moment like, man, I'm like, I can't sustain this. I can't, I can't keep it up, you know? And, and we were barely scratching the surface of the potential, I think, for like humanizing the badge or any of the social media stuff. Whereas my job, I was, I was maxed out. And, and let me explain, because when I first became a cop, I had go, I had goals in my career for like detective and different things like that, doing different uh, aspects of the job. Well, I got laid off from the first department that I was describing earlier about FTO. I got laid off uh, three years in, wow. Wow. and there was a whole whole deal where I would have never gone back to work for that department uh, because of the people that in the city, not not the officers, but the the right. city uh, was. It was just absolutely uh, full of liars and corrupt politicians, Jeez. basically. So uh, I wasn't going to co- go put myself in that situation again, just to wonder: Are they lying again? And am I going to lose my job again? Yeah. You know. So. Um, I obviously took another job in another department and I already I already missed so many opportunities because at that department, if you wanted a special assignment, whether it was canine or narcotics or anything, you had to have two years on there at that department. So here I am five years in just now qualifying for anything different and those positions had already been filled. Mm -hmm. So then I did the FTO thing, which was was awesome. And then. Then uh, I couldn't do – because of the social media, uh, narcotics was out. I got, I got turned away by the state police. I didn't apply because I, I approached the lieutenant in charge of the task force ahead of time, and I was like, here's the deal. Could I even apply? He's like, don't bother. You won't get it. Sure, <laughs> like, right. your, face, your face is out there, yeah. blah, 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 not going to happen. And then uh, – so I set my eyes on the one other option that we had was uh, DEA, and I just uh, – I applied, did the whole thing, didn't get the spot. So I didn't get that, and then I was faced with uh, detective was by seniority in mm-hmm. my department. So here I am, eight years on the job, uh, you know, seen it all, done it all, blah, blah, blah. And I'm kind of like I'm, I'm that personality that needs a new challenge every, every yeah, couple I'm of saying, years, yeah, you know. know that, that and so I'm like social media is taking – this whole thing's taking off. Here I am. How how many how many more years am I going to push this scout car? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, am I going to push this car? I'm like, I've done car chases, I've done foot chase, I fought the bad right. guy. Uh, you know, like, how many more dope arrests do I need? How many more guns do I need? Like, how how much more do I need to really do in the next five years before I even stand a chance at being somebody that could get into the DB mm-hmm. or whatever? And so I was kind of like faced with that decision, like a fork in the road. You know, like. And that's why I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for it. And it, if I fall on my face, I'm still young enough and, and I could still come back to the to the road and get a job and, and be a cop full time. If, if everything fails, because uh, I've started some other businesses that are non-social media related and things like sure. that. So I'm like, I, I, I'm doing this stuff. If I fail, well, then I fail. But at least at least, at least I you tried. tried. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and yeah, and, and you so learned a valuable like, lesson from it, too. Yeah, so I, I that I did the part time thing, hoping that okay I can keep my cert and you know go through all that stuff and and obviously we're we're now at this point again where I'm faced with another decision like I can't give up more time than I'm already giving to that sure. job that kind of a thing because it's definitely not about the money because I uh, I pay I pay my gas money to get there and back right. that's about it yeah. so um, so you know uh, here I am and that that's sort of like how that decision was made and hopefully. You know, I, that's all I can hope for. Hopefully, I'm making the right decisions. Maybe I'm not, but I hope right. I, I think you are. I, I, I th- for I th- sure, I think you are. I think you've, you know, for especially for for men, I think, but anybody in general, but for men, for sure, we got to have a mission in life. There's got to be something that we're focused on and feel like we're yeah. accomplishing. Especially the personalities that are in law enforcement and military, there yeah. has to be that we're we're servants. We're public servants. We want to help. We want to do something. And so you got to feel that at the end of the day. If you're not filling that void, it's going to your your life feels off a little bit. Yeah, I love how you put that. Men need a mission. 
Yeah, I, I, I really think that's yeah, a trademark. I, yeah, I feel, I feel, yeah. <laughs> I feel, no, I, I really believe that. I, re- I really believe that you, you know, and you do reach a point, especially in, in this job where it's just like, God, I've done that. I've answered that call 5,000 times. I've done this. I've done that. You know, and you, you kind of end up in a spinning of wheels situation where you're just like, what's the next move? What's the next direction? And sometimes you have to create those avenues because those opportunities yeah. aren't going to be there. You talked about it right there with, you know, not being able to go into narcotics or, or anything like that because you're, you were already out there. You know, it's like, okay, well, that's doors closed. So what do I do with that? I, I think, I think you're on the yeah. right path. I mean, obviously you've, you've garnered a lot of success. So I think, um, I think for sure it, it shows. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> so how, um, for the, for people that don't know about anything about humanize the badge, right? Yeah. Um, and somebody came and said, "What is humanize the badge? What what would you, how would you explain that to them? How you would, or how would you explain the organization to them and what y'all do?" Yeah, I mean it's pretty straightforward. We uh, we kind of like I'm a fan of saying like it's built into the name, yeah, <laughs> right? Like sure. we will, we want to show people that we're people and uh, our our actual formal way of expressing it is that we just want to forge stronger relationships between the law enforcement and the communities they serve. Like that's like, we, we want to inspire people, uh, departments to come together and have strong, strong, uh, relationships in their communities with law enforcement, because obviously like cops tend to be very reactive, Yes, you know, because you call us when something happens, we're not the freaking minority report and know when it's going to mm-hmm. happen. So we, you know, we can, we tend to be that way, but when the community's involved, they can sort of like fill that in and every, everybody's concern should be all of our kids safety and all of our, all of our mutual benefit. We want to, we want to make that a real strong priority. So for us then I think everybody wants that, but to answer how we do it is we do our, our project humans, which tend to be about every quarter. Mm -hmm. Our next one is coming up in just a couple of weeks in Vegas where, uh, we come in and I think we'll be spending time in a juvenile detention facility. Oh, nice. Uh, talk, talking to kids and um, doing that alongside officers and hearing from their experiences and that kind of stuff. And then we're doing like a, a community barbecue where officers and people from the community are there. And we hope to just sort of like set a good example with them, encourage them. And typically we'll take money that we raise and also funnel it into local organizations on the ground before we leave. So that That's like awesome. We just want to set the right example for them and hopefully build these relationships and have a strong network of people committed to the same thing. Right. And and then uh, strangely enough, we never intended for this, but once we started growing on social media, we were constantly getting messages of, hey, I was just in a shooting and I, I don't know how to tell my spouse. I was – uh, or we would get a spouse reaching out and saying, I don't know what happened at work, but my husband hasn't said a word to me in four days. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know what to do. Help me. Um, and we were just looking at, at these situations. We're like, how can, how can we turn this away? I don't even, like, how can we not do this? But I'm like, I can talk to anybody about any topic, but I'm not a professional by any stretch of the means, you know? So like we began to develop this team of people uh, around uh, people who could, be like uh stress triage you know to where we could see like does this person just need someone to talk to okay we got a whole group of people that can that can fit that bill and or do they need someone that's a little bit more knowledgeable and can have a lengthy conversation okay we can add some people to the team to do that or do they need to be referred out to like long term somebody locally in person that can be walk them through this stuff you know and we try to identify that and and start making those moves and then it just really stood out to us how many cops are killing themselves. Yes. And yeah, that's, we, yeah, uh, that's, it's an epidemic actually. And it's never yeah, talked it's, about. It's, it's never, never talked about. No. And so we started the call for backup campaign. And so we have like our, our mental health team and the call for backup is, uh, we, we just, we just have done like three trainings and in the last three months or month or so. So it's been crazy. And, we go in for a four-hour block. We're doing one in Vegas, and we're basically we're we're basically saying awareness that this is a problem isn't enough, right? Like prevention, you have to take action mm-hmm. steps. It's kind of like it's kind of like the ice bucket challenge. Well, it's great that a lot of people know that ALS exists, but 
what are we doing? Right. right. You know, like, so we don't want, we didn't want to do like challenges or whatever else to like bring awareness. That's awareness is important, but we wanted to actually identify what can I do as a street cop? What can I do in a department with a partner, with somebody that I recognize these, how do I recognize signs that there's a problem and what do I say? What do I do? And so like you got the below 100 campaign that gives you very concrete things to do. And we like worked real hard to be like, how can we give people concrete action steps and things to do? And I'm not the expert on that by any stretch of the imagination. We have a team of people that, you know, they're, they're focused on doing sure, that. It's so awesome. You guys put that in place too, man. So, um, if there was like, uh, if there was somebody out there that was not involved in law enforcement, but, um, wanted to be involved in the organization, how would they go about doing that? Um, usually we just, from like your typical person, we just really love our cheerleaders, man, that like they share what we, they share the content that we put out there. They promote it, you know, donating, you know, whether it's getting a t-shirt or, or donating on our live streams for different goofy stuff that we do or whatever it is, like that support is so necessary to make the work happen. And then uh, typically when we do these projects, uh, we'll have people like uh, last year in San Diego, we did a neighborhood cleanup in El Cajon where drug dealers hang out and spray paint stuff all day, you know, and we had the, the community was invited out. Uh, there was the, there was our, our team, the El Cajon Police Department and members of the community all there doing it. So like we, we just put the word out there. And if there's public aspects to these projects, then by all means, we, we get people to kind of come pitch a pitch a hand and where where it works sure. out. And then I saw you guys were coming to uh, Dallas Fort Worth. Um, I think some 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 of our team is coming there for something on uh, seven seven, yeah. and uh, I don't know what that what that's going to be. I think we're trying to like, I think we're kind of coming alongside more of the law enforcement thing right mm-hmm. now. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Dallas PD and some of the nonsense that they're dealing with right I, now financially actually, and everything. Yeah. I'm actually very familiar with it. So we uh, we're we're not so sure that we're, we want to look for, for guys in that area to like volunteer with us on projects more than we want to come in and just kind of like give them a space to come yeah. be encouraged. So we'll, you know, we're working on what that'll look there's like. There's a, right? there's an organization, um, that's, uh, in Dallas, um, that is heavily involved with, uh, Dallas and the, uh, transit police there who b- mm-hmm. both organizations lost, uh, people on seven, yep. seven. Uh, called assist the officer. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, um, but yeah. if uh, they would probably be a good source, um, and I can give you some contact information when we get off the air. Um, somebody personally that I know um, that would probably definitely probably help you guys out. Cool. Um, so switching gears just a little bit. Um, I don't know, it's kind of an opinion question, but. Uh, given the, uh, given the increased threat to law enforcement in general, ambush attacks, and the fact that law enforcement is essentially the front line in com- in combating terrorist events as they unfold in our communities, um, what is your take on the so-called quote unquote militarization of the police? Uh, I think it's dumb to call it that. <laughs> <I agree>. Like, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh. It, it makes no – I mean it just makes no sense. Uh, it's it's kind of like telling someone who went to Planet Fitness with an Under Armour shirt that it's the over <laughs> of their workout. Like come on. I mean like what are you talking about? Like we know that Under Armour helps you know, with like wick, wick away the sweat, you morons. Right. So like what do you want to wear a, a – a, a 100% cotton tee as heavy as possible for your workouts or I mean, where do you want to be comfortable? So it's like it's the same thing like – uh, my back suffers, not yours. So why can't I put a vest on the outside? Right, exa- like, yeah, I'm the one that's dealing with yeah. Exactly. So I think, again, that's one of those issues where perception, it's the battle for perception. And the perception is that the police are militarized. And the reality is we're not even anywhere close to being not, militarized. Not even close. Nope. Nope, you're absolutely Trust right. Trust me, I was in the military. This gear sucks compared to what I wore in the Army. Yeah. No, <laughs> hey, we were talking to uh, uh, Dr. Mike Simpson uh, a couple episodes ago, and um, we're talking about the, the health effects, the long-term health effects that happen with the type of gear that we have, that, you know, all the crap on the belt and 
you know, how, how much more beneficial it would be to having, you know, load bearing vests and all that kind of stuff and how it's really right. comes down to professional police service and not necessarily what you wear, but, um, right. Well, if you teach your kids that that's, that's a big scary man with that wears an outer vest. Well, that's, that's where the problem sure. is. It's not a, if you, if you, if the perception was, Oh, that's a guy that's, you know, here to, here to protect exactly. us. And he's a really, he's a really good, good guy. Yeah. And he wears that vest because it helps his back feel better yeah. <laughs> and protects him. Protects him. Know, yeah. like, and, and I think that, uh, I, I really believe that most people, and this is just from talking to people. I, I, I really think that the people that support cops, which is, I still believe is the majority of people, um, even if, the, yeah, even, even if they're not vocal about it, but I, I really believe that that people want their police to, to to have all the gear that they need to be protected because they know that if they have that, then then if that person needs help someday, that officer is going to have everything he needs to come, you know, handle the whatever situation they're in. And and the people that are are anti that stuff um, are pro- probably the people that we're, we're we're for the most part, not every time, but probably you know the people that are worried about the police you know, meeting them in general. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I really believe that if you, you know, and, I, and I've seen other, depa- I've seen departments do this around the country um, where they have that kind of equipment and they're professional. They do their job. They, they uphold their oath. They're not violating anybody's rights. They're just way more comfortable. Way more comfortable. And have, have the gear, <laughs> have the gear that, you know, works in any situation where if you got into a, if there was an active shooter or there was a barricaded person or some critical incident, they can plug in all the quote unquote, you know, SWAT slash military, you know, gear that your rifle or your helmet or whatever and, and be prepared, right. but not have to waste all yeah. that time of, Oh, I got to get this off and I got to put this on. And, you know, I mean, if I'm rolling to an active shooter, you know, I'm not, I want that stuff to protect. I want me. that stuff on already. I don't want, yeah, especially don't, a plate right. carrier. You're just wasting precious moments, but yeah, exactly. Caveat to that question: Do you think that law enforcement as a profession, and and this could even is really kind of directed at leadership, but um, is failing police officers when it comes to things like firearms training, critical decision making, combatives? Yes, 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 a hundred percent, thousand percent. I definitely think with combatives. I I mean, I've never met a police department that has a combatives program. There's some like I uh, I have the the first department I worked for uh, we did uh, Krav Maga their their law enforcement program and it was eight hours a year wow wow and I'll tell you what if you learn like this Jason Bourne shit and you're gonna you think you're gonna remember that yeah. after one eight hour class it's not happening. And without without practicing it regularly at full intensity yeah. it ain't happening which is that's why I do uh, and then at the next department. I talked to guys that have been 18 years on. They never had it since the academy. Yep. And I, I, I begged and I begged and I pleaded, like, guys, if 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 it's not the safety of your officers that matters in these situations, it is the li- – you are a walking liability, every single one of us. Because when I blow someone's kneecap out with a kick and they say, where did you learn that? And I go, I don't know, Texas Walker Ra- – you know, like, what <laughs> – you think that you, – how do you think the defense attorney is going to feel? Because, yeah. like – I mean, because like, you didn't teach me. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, no. You know, so it, it's it's terrible. But that's I, I'm uh, if if you listen to my stuff, like I definitely like I'm a big yeah. big opponent of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, mm-hmm. and uh, we we just talked about it today on the, on our show too, man. It's like it's it's the only thing that I have ever encountered where I can practice 100 percent against a resisting person, sure. and no one no one needs to get injured. Exactly. Well, and I think it's the same thing with firearms training. And, and and even, you know, reality based training, critical decision making, it, it, those are perishable skills. And if you don't, if you don't totally. maintain them, if you don't practice them, um, you lose them. You lose them. They deteriorate oh, yeah. with like with everything. For sure. Else, but yeah, I saw you had Tim Kennedy on. Uh, he's that guy's a certified badass in just about everything. Straight up. Jesus, yeah. I would, if he ran for president, I might just write him in <laughs> on the next election. That dude loves. I was talking America, to uh, Dakota Meyer. Uh, and he he trains with him regularly, yeah. and he's just like that guy is like when he's when he's grappling with you, man. It's like it's you're you're definitely gonna lose. <laughs> oh yeah, I if, well yeah, I I you know I I've listened to uh, Jocko Willink's podcast, uh, Jocko podcast, and he's you know yeah. a huge proponent of, of jujitsu. Jujitsu's life for him, you know, and it's just these guys are incredible. I mean, but they. They're right. I mean, they you know they talk about how if you're just if you're a if you're a white belt in jujitsu, right? Um, 
you know, about a year in, uh, pretty much most people you encounter that aren't going to have training, you're going to subdue them. You're going to be able to win that Absolutely. fight. Absolutely. Oh yeah. It's it's yep. an incredible thing, and I I really wish that departments would would partner up with you know gym jujitsu gyms and, and MMA gyms and and there's so many people like in Metro Detroit like there's so many academies that I know that have offered straight up free training mm-hmm. and and cops just don't do it and it's it's their a lot of it is a obviously they have to take their own time right yeah. sure. so if it was built into built into something well, in yeah. your day yeah and that, that'd be fine like i know uh U- university of michigan police department actually builds in an hour of fitness time into their shift um and you you get to go exercise so you could you could build in dropping the gear and and exercise shower up and go back on patrol yeah. like that could happen but a lot of guys especially with grappling I found it's an ego issue because if they do go to the gym regularly and they're really good at bicep curls and then, you know, some 15 year old girl puts them in a triangle and taps them out and they, they wake up later and (laughs) they're like, I can't come back here. I'm a cop. I can't be, I can't let these guys tap me out, you know? Oh, and and Big Bo and I've seen it and cops are so funny. Like you would think if you offered a cop something free, he'd be all over it. Right. (laughs) But as soon as it's involves their off time. Oh, yeah. It's like, no, nope. I don't think I'll be able to do it. Yeah. But no. they'll go to off-duty. Yeah, they'll go work an off-duty job. Yep. You know? Um, so we're going to have a serious question. You can answer this question, man. If not, I, I totally get it. Um, if not, we'll just edit this out. Um, so there, is that is that cool with you? Yeah. Okay, cool. He's like, I don't right. know what it is, but okay. Right. There are people out there that may not know this about you, but uh, you have a brother that was killed in the line of duty. Um, so yeah. often something this tragic occurs, people tend to tunnel in on the way someone died but forget about how they lived um would you do us the honor of telling our listeners about him and what he was like and what he meant to you uh yeah i mean obviously he meant like a crazy amount to me as like it was like i said when we were growing up it was just me and him yeah so i mean like everything we did was together and something uh my mom my my brother and i were in a a car accident when I was six, uh, shortly after we moved here, uh, back to Michigan, a drunk driver swerved into our lane and my mom had to swerve to avoid it. So, so we had a rollover oh, accident oh, and it left my, left my mom paralyzed. Oh, and wow. so Jesus. I'm sorry. we, uh, we grew up with that. Like basically we, we grew up fast, right? We, yeah. my, my dad was working two jobs and you know, we helped take care of my mom and all this stuff. So like we were very, very close in, a, in other words. So like as far as what he meant to me, it was like, you know, brother, best friend, you know, all, all that stuff that you, I guess you would expect. Um, and then he became a cop before I did. Uh, and we both had worked actually in at the same store uh, doing security. Oh, cool. And but he d- he ended up doing like a uh, <laughs> grocery stocking not not the security <laughs> part like because he made more money he made more money than me, yeah. like doing assist assistant manager or whatever so uh so that that happened but you know he went through the Detroit Police Academy and uh you know I kind of like watched him go through that whole process and uh saw how much our personalities were very very similar and I saw how much he enjoyed the job and getting to know other cops through him and uh, and all that. He was very much my, my sort of like inspiration to, to pull the proverbial trigger and actually finally do what it took to, you know, get myself to the Academy and get a job. So, cool. I mean, certainly like a huge motivation. He, he had, he had one officer of the year through POAM and, you know, had, you know, life saving and all, all the other s- stuff, you know, that would go along with someone that you would think did the job to like the max ability that they had. And so he, he definitely lived that out and was super well respected, you know, in the department and in the community. And so, I mean, I, I have nothing but, I mean, good things to say, awesome. obviously. Yeah. I mean, he could be an asshole just like me. So, <laughs> um, What are some of the things or processes you do in order to make improvements in your life? Uh, I'm learning that, um, I'm learning to identify the places where I lie to myself. Uh, mm-hmm. Let me allow me to explain. Okay. So, explain like, explain that we uh, a lot of people want a lot of things in life. I guess we might say, let's say, I want uh, 
I want to be in better shape. Yeah. That's, that's a, a general one. But I also really want this whole pizza, right? <laughs> so, like, and the struggle is real. So, the, it is. And, it, and that's just like a really basic example of what I'm seeing in my life about, like, okay, I want a better marriage. I want a better this. Like, so I want to, you have these different categories or whatever it is. And you're, I, I've realized that. I might really want I might really want to be in better shape and I'm not lying about it but when I step back and pause for a second it's really like third on the list. Mm. It's not it's not high enough to actually take action. Okay. And so I'm learning to just try to pause and then decide what's that what's the one next step that I can take to get where I want to go. Yeah. And that that's what I'm learning most in these days is it's okay to pause long enough to be honest with yourself about where you're sort of like deceiving yourself. Yeah. Like uh and and to stop wanting so many things and doing a lot more. I think it's a lot more important to do more things effectively than it is to want a million things. Yeah. So uh, learning to say no to certain things in life too, that like, I would, I love to do a lot of different things, but I'm, I'd, I'd rather at this point in my life, get really, really good at just a handful. Okay, cool. Um, are there any books or movies that have had an impact on your life for the better? Oh man, <laughs> all, all kinds of, all kinds of things. Oh, awesome. Uh, Let's hear them. Jeez. <laughs> uh, the books. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, a more recent one that has had a big impact on me i think i read a book uh, by a guy named andy stanley called communicating for a change and uh that's i'm still struggling to figure out how do i apply those principles into uh because now that i i want to do more more of this kind of interaction and less of the skit comedy type thing yeah. like i i still want it to be uh, I still want people to laugh and be engaged, but I, I also love like the off of the off the cuff type interaction. And so I'm learning how can I be prepared to communicate what I want to communicate in effective ways and still have people listen. Yeah. You know, because normally on normally on YouTube, like y you can't go for 30 minutes or something like that no, or whatever. I so 10 or 15 how do minutes. I. But we'll watch a stand up comedy show. Yeah. You know, that could go an hour if you can keep people engaged then it's good. So I've been really focused on how can I improve my communication skills to hold people's attention in the right ways. And I think I got a long, long road ahead of me to, to dial that in. But that book has been really, really good for me over the last few months to, to help dial in my, uh, my preparation to communicate and, and my actual delivery. Cool. What about movies? Oh, dude, like, well, Step Brothers is like my oh, life. Okay. So right. probably my favorite uh, comedy movie. Really? Yeah. So <laughs> it's uh, definitely top it's a game. Five. It's Anch floating. Anchorman was a game changer for me in, <laughs> in the Man community. Uh, the other guys, any of the, 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 a lot of the Will Ferrell stuff I love. Um, I, I, I'll have classic, classic films that are like my go-tos. Most of them are unfortunately because of, you know, personally, I probably don't like a lot of what Quentin Tarantino stands for, but Pulp Fiction, you know, is huge. Pulp Fiction and, is a great movie. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, of Quentin Tarantino movies. Inglorious Bastards, I've watched like 18 times. Uh, there's that. I like the and Hateful Eight. The classics, right? Brave Braveheart uh, is a classic that's like never gonna get old. No. And I make my kids watch that stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> sit down and watch this with your old man. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, you 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 brought up uh, wanting to kind of transition more into this media form, you know, and uh, you know there is a uh, People like podcasts are crazy, right? Because I think it was two years ago. I think it was 2000. Well, God, three years ago now, 2015, something like 18% of Americans were listening to podcasts. And mm -hmm. since then it's jumped up to 48%. And yeah. I think there's, and we find this on TV, we find it on social media. And I think social media and the internet has been the biggest cause of this, but you find these little short, you know, five, six, seven, ten, maybe up to 15 minute videos. And that is the extent of most people's um, attention span, like on, right. on the surface. Yeah. But there is a real desire and consumption market out there for long form conversational podcasting. Because 
That yeah. stuff doesn't exist anymore. You know, back in the day, you had uh, you had you know people sat down for interviews and they were like an hour long, right. and people watched it because they were really interested in what these individuals had to say. Um, yeah. And we don't we don't really do that anymore. And I think that's there's there's something missing, and that's why I think podcasts are so uh, so important. That's why we jumped into podcasting instead of doing like a YouTube thing or, or whatever was because we felt like yeah. people will sit down and listen. They'll listen to an hour. They'll listen to two hours. There's podcasts out there that are four hours long. Hardcore history with Dan Carlin is, yeah. is you know, his episodes are four to six hours long and people love it. And, and, yeah. and it's incredible. And I, 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 I find it encouraging actually that, um, you know, like you're, you're, you're kind of moving more, more into that because I, I really do think that uh, beyond I'm 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 not just throwing you compliments here, but I I really I really do think that that beyond the the comedy, I really I you know when I listen or watch your videos where you're actually talking about um, a, a, a a real topic or an, an important yeah. topic, I really do feel like you have a lot to contribute to that, and I I really do think that people would would consume that from you for sure, and I I definitely I would definitely enjoy um, yeah, seeing more of that, that from you it, for sure. I, I think uh, I think culturally. Like I feel like I'm 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 regretting not getting into the podcast game a little bit earlier. Right. Um. But at, at the same time, you know, now now is as good a time as any. And the we see this with Netflix, right? I want to watch the content I want. I don't want a commercial. I want to watch what I want to watch. Exactly. And I think that we're going to see a huge shift in the next year to two years where podcasts are going to be the same way. Like I want to consume the content that I want. Mm-hmm. I don't want the radio telling me what songs next. Yep. I, you know, I want, and if I want to listen to this show, this is the show that I want to listen to on my drive or when I'm working out or yeah, hundred percent agree. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you, uh, and stop me if you've already done this, but, um, if you were invited to speak at a police academy, police academy graduation, what, yeah. what advice would you give to, future cops uh i i think that i would say that you need to make sure that it's always something that comes from your gut you know you you gotta want it and the minute you stop wanting it is the minute you should get out and uh and figure out what it is that you can do that you're really passionate about but this job i think requires uh or we should we should want the the men and women out there doing this job we should want them to want this real bad you know, Agreed. I think I think they should really it's got to be a fire in your belly that you want to do it and you want to run in the opposite direction of everybody else. So I, I think that that's don't ever lose that. And when you do, you need to you need to need to rekindle it somehow uh, or or it's time to move on, you know, and you've done your service because you, you don't want to be a liability to yourself or others. Sure. And uh, and I think we're I man. Uh, if if you'll indulge me to, to think Go ahead, off, man. off the cuff Go here, ahead. I tell you what, um, I feel that um, that a twenty five year law enforcement career is asinine. Mm. Um, I, Agreed. I, I look over and over and over and over again, and just like you two agree, everybody agrees. You can't do this job that long and not jack yourself up in some way. Like it's oh, yeah. it's only by the grace of God that. You know, we all don't jump off a bridge. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's it's like uh, it's for a lot of reasons, and nothing's ever going to change, right? Life is cyclical. There's always going to be bad guys. Yep. There's always going to be morons. There's always going to be people saying that someone came through a portal. Right. Yes. It's always going to happen. Yep. yep. So, uh, but we have to stay fresh on our end, and we don't we don't stay fresh. It's very very difficult, and that's part of the reason. Like, i am made the decisions I've made with my career is just because I'm like, I'm looking at that going, I don't know how much longer I should be doing this part of the job. Right. You know, like yeah. there, it should be like, I, I see it over and over and over again. I'll, I'll, I'll mark it arbitrarily at 10 years. I don't see very many happy cops after 10 years on the road. I agree with you. That, that's, so, that's true. It's rare. Now I might see cops that did eight or nine years on the road and now they're now they're in UC work or now they're doing yep. this and and they're happy. Now they're in now they're at the academy and they're teaching academy classes or they're assigned to the this division or whatever. Like they have something different. Like 
uh, to keep new challenges and and new ways of fresh perspectives and challenges in the job. Mm -hmm. But yep. to do this, to do routine patrol work for that long, uh, the the amount of damage that it does psychologically and physically to be on hyper vigilance for that for that long in those stretches is uh it's not intelligent <laughs> no i i agree with you i and i have probably met literally i could count them on one hand cops that have worked the road for 20 years and like they're like yeah i, w I can't imagine doing anything else right yeah right. those, yeah. those but, cops yeah. are rare but most people and you find this i mean i found this in 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 smaller departments where they don't have special units and they don't Man, people just get tired of it. They just get tired of going to the same call over and over again, dealing with the same yeah. people over and over again, doing the same routine over and over again. And you have to give people a change because you have to keep people motivated. Yep. You have to. I mean, they, you got to give them, especially if they have certain strengths, you know, certain interests, you got to you gotta foster those. Otherwise, you lose interest in the job. You really do. And it leads to career problems. It leads to disgruntledness. It leads to bad attitudes. It leads to other issues outside of the job. Um and I think I think it's super important that department, you know, especially your mid-sized to smaller departments that don't have those sort of avenues, that they find some way to, yeah, you know, make it happen to keep the 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 core of their officers interested in the job. And it's hard. Yeah. It's 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 hard to do. That. It's a hard balance, and I don't even have the answer for that. Um, I was just about I was about to say the same thing. Yeah. I don't. I'm not sitting here with some type of master plan. Oh, no, to solve not, problem, yeah, not at all. <laughs> yeah, not at all. But there, but there has to be an answer. If there's a discussion about it, there has to be an answer somewhere. Oh yeah. You know, and I, and I think that's right. part of the problem is it has to be discussed. You know, I think people get bogged down and, you know, well, you should just show up with a good attitude and do your job. Okay. Well, right. that's, that's cool and everything, but I'm also a human being, you know, also like <laughs> I get bored. I have nope. interests. I have, you know, you just can't, <laughs> right. You just can't do it. But no, I agree with you. Um, so, switching venues, now you're in front of a group of high school students about to graduate. What do you tell them? <laughs> I don't, don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> don't do drugs, okay? Uh, yeah, don't do drugs. Uh, get your TPS reports in on time. Uh, I don't know. I don't, uh, F, F the police. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I would tell them um, to, uh, I think, a mix of two things. Um always to always believe in themselves and to and to never ever give up on the goals that they have for their life but in the process to never ever think that you are bigger than you are so to you know stay strong but stay humble i guess is the is the is the boil down on that it's like you, you, got, you yeah. got to push got to push forward but you can't be can't become too big in your own mind man yeah for sure so uh, if you were approached uh, to write an autobiography about your life, what would to up to this point, up to where you're at now, what would that book be called? How to Lose Friends and Irritate People. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. A Simple Man's Guide. A Simple Man's Guide. A Simple Man's Guide. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I I should I should write that parody book from the classic uh who wrote that? Uh How to Win Friends and Impl Dale Carnegie. Yes. Uh, yeah, like the just kind of parody, parody exactly how he does exactly. it. Exactly, chapter like. by chapter too. You <laughs> yes, should just troll yes. the shit out of him the whole book. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm gonna do it. I gotta get started. I'm working on the second volume of you can't make this stuff up like ridiculous cop yeah. stories. Like I'm working on the second volume of that right I'm now. I'm working so on a flat earth book. Oh god. There you go. The sun rises somewhere. Yeah. So maybe not in the east. Exactly. Or does it set at all? Oh god, here we go. <laughs> oh, just... <clears throat> if said autobiography was made into a major motion picture, who would play you? Oh man, who should play me? Uh, I don't know. I, I, would I be honored? I'd be honored if. Uh, <laughs> is it be weird to have Will Ferrell play me? No, <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, I mean he can be a serious actor, right? No, you know who? What? No, I take that back. Not Will Ferrell. It would be one of the Wahlberg brothers. Any of them? Ooh, any Wahlberg? Donnie. That's what I'm giving you. <laughs> the new kid off the block. Perfect. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you want people to? You want people to? You want people to watch it though, right? He's on what is that show? Blue Bloods. He's on that. He's oh, he's on Blue Bloods. Yeah, yeah he's a cop yeah. in that show. He would. I yep. mean, he would know exactly what Danny, to do. Danny Reagan. Yep, and he would like just break out into song occasionally because he can do that too. Exactly. Ver very versatile. You he didn't think about this, JC. You I didn't, didn't think I didn't about think all about this. That. You're right. <laughs> Way to go, Mike. You thought you thought this out. No, I didn't. I, I had to take it back. <laughs> 
my instinct was Will Ferrell, but I knew I was wrong. You knew you were wrong. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, how do you find the motivation to keep on when things are not going well or you just want to quit? Uh, I, I think I just default back to kind of like what we were talking about yeah. earlier. Like I, I have to find something. And yeah. I, I've been there. Like I you kind of you have to have like a circle of things that motivate you. Um, and I think when things that we're passionate about – we're we're weird creatures in that we can forget about what matters pretty easily yeah. and so just having having that time to just pause and think uh i don't call it meditation but i try to like have like these moments where i think what what's important you know like uh what matters to me yeah and just stop and, and that think. gotta gotta find something to motivate you like i don't know if someone doesn't have anything that motivates them i don't even know how to help them like i got i, I that's what you got to try to help them find is what do you care about right like, why yeah. why do you wake up you know true um okay last last few questions all right i've got a couple more for you um have you ever faced any sort of social adversity in your life and if so how did you deal with it and social adversity could be a variety of things like a bully growing up or um, people trolling you on social, social media, media or, sure. or professionally or, well, or that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know uh, I, obviously you, you, I'm sure you, you get your amazing comments on social media, but, um, but like just, you know, any, anything that, that, that kind of wasn't a, a private struggle, but like a public struggle that you had. Uh, you know, I think, Growing up with the circumstances that I did with having a mom show up to my events in a wheelchair and just be different from everybody else sure. was something that was like always there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think I think my parents uh, helped me, I guess, respond to that pretty well. Yeah. And we, you know, I, I guess we're always around people that were were different because I spent a lot of time then she actually ended up competing in the Paralympics and oh, wow. well, that's uh, awesome. That's amazing. So learning to overcome like the circumstance like that. And, and then, so that put me around a lot of handicapped people, like re some extremely handicapped, like can't speak mentally re re retardation, you know, like all the way up to, you know, high functioning people that were just like, didn't have a leg and they had a fake leg and played basketball, you know, like, uh, whatever it was, I, I honestly grew up in an environment where black, white, handicapped, not handicapped, whatever, like, but I, I always got like the, the typical stereotypical sort of like looks or, you know, people <laughs> cracking jokes when you knew they were cracking jokes or whatever yeah. else like that. I mean, but I don't look back at that as like some kind of uh, honestly like adversity. Like I feel like I, that's, I had it pretty easy compared to most people in the world. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, all right. Well, with that, uh, what kind of what, what upcoming projects or events do you have? Uh, plug, we got, plug away. Uh, humanizing the badge. We're going to Vegas in April, and then uh, I'll be speaking at the Blue Line Ball in Minneapolis in the first weekend in May. And then I'm going out to another law enforcement appreciation type event out in New Mexico toward the end of May. And then from there, I don't. I don't know what else is on the schedule hard hard dates uh, from there, but uh, I'm looking to just continue to keep growing my business and social media, you know, presence and and hope for the best. <laughs> wow, oh, yeah, that's all you can yeah. do. All right, speaking about we, social we have, media, man, where can people find you? At? Uh, everywhere. Uh, <laughs> if you look up Mike the Cop on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Snapchat. I'm a, well, my Snapchat's weird because it's Mike underscore the cop one, the number one. It's, it's terrible. Uh, was there, was YouTube, there another one before you? Uh, there, apparently there was. Apparently there was. Uh, PlayStation Network, uh, Mike the Cop, Xbox. I'm on there somewhere. Uh, stream gaming, Mike the Cop. I'm everywhere. Twitch, real Mike the Cop. Like I'm trying to be everywhere and see where it goes. All over off the, the cuff, place, huh? off the cuff podcast. My favorite thing. Cool. <laughs> right, right. And and we're 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 you mentioned earlier uh, SoundCloud and iTunes right for the podcast. Yep. Yeah, if you look up off the cuff, it just comes up with like some uh, BDSM thing. So be just this, that's not me. Uh, so just a heads up. <laughs> okay, but, uh, all right, all right. <laughs> look for the donut box with a shotgun on it, and uh, off the cuff, Mike the cop gets you 
Like I'm the, the second thing on iTunes when you search that, I think. Gotcha. Okay, so we, cool. de- we definitely encourage people to go check that out. Yeah. Well, Mike, we really appreciate you being on the podcast and giving us some time to, to talk. And we it appreciate awesome. you guys. It was awesome. And uh, Thanks, we really man. appreciate, we appreciate it. it. We yeah. hope to have you on uh, again at some point. Yeah, man. That's awesome. Awesome. All right. Thanks, man. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. So, Big Bo. Yeah. That was awesome. That was great, man. I yeah. want to thank Mike the Cop for coming on, man. He's he's great. He didn't have to do that. He's an awesome dude, man. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty fun. Check out his podcast. Check and him out on social media. What I found out is he actually listens to our podcast. Which is pretty cool. Which is really freaking awesome. Yeah. It's, I really like that. I it's nice when I we talk to people that actually listen. That actually listen to it, yes. Yeah. That is really cool when we get guests that actually like our product, and they're yep. like, of course I wanted to come on because I really like your product. Yep. God, it's awesome. I know. I like yep. it. Um, so, well... Now that we plug Mike the Cop, why don't you plug us? With this again. Oh, I want to tell you. That's how this goes. I want to tell you I got a really positive response from the sponsors for last week's intro. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So what's funny is Jeff called me. I don't know. You know I'm talking about? Jeff Bezos? Oh, my God. He sent me a cease and desist letter, which I don't know what that means. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. I feel like it means keep going. But I feel like that's exactly what I mean, because I didn't read it. I saw cease and desist. I was like, well, my mom's already dead. Well, I don't know who this cease person is. I would have assumed cease and desist means stop reading at this point. I thought it was a new rapper. So I'm going to oh, play yeah, hey, yeah. cease and desist. Go check his SoundCloud out. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. But look, if you want to find us, <laughs> our Amazon <laughs> click through, Jeff. Go to streetwarriorradio.com. Talking to, Talking to you, Jeff Bezos. Want to drop us? You don't drop me. Drop you. You drop us. Don't drop us. Drop you. Stop, drop, and roll. Drop, drop yourself. Drop yourself. Stop. Drop. Set them down. Open up shop. Okay? Find us at streetwarriorradio.com. Um, that's the main place where you can find the Amazon click through there and do all your Amazon shopping. Also, uh, Instagram. At StreetWarriorRadio.com, Facebook StreetWarriorRadio.com, YouTube StreetWarriorRadio.com. Why are you adding .com to everything? We're not .com on there? I mean, the website's .com. Okay, um, Instagram StreetWarriorRadio, <laughs> Facebook StreetWarriorRadio. Go through this again. I think yeah. people get it. Facebook Street Warrior Radio. Um, Twitter is at... S-T-R-T, the word warrior, R-D-I-O. I'm going to remember this one week. I really You're will. You're never going to remember that. I'm going to totally remember We're that. We're 14, ep- this is 14, episode 14. Is it episode 14? St- yes, st- episode 14, and you still don't 14 remember. divided by 4. There's That's not a, that's not a. That's a number. It's not a number. I mean, it's a number, but it's like with a decimal and all sorts of other shit behind it. Well, what's the whole number? I don't fucking know. It's going to be. You're asking me math questions. That's 4 times 4, 16. It's gonna be, you can't divide 14 by 4 and get a solid number. We've been doing this for about three and a half months, everybody. You're welcome. Okay? Just show us some love, too. We show you love. We come out here every week. Every week. Um, If you can, uh, take time out of your day. Go on YouTube and go to Street Warrior Radio. Look us up. You can hear our episodes there if you have time. Honestly, honestly the YouTube thing sucks. You like, know, I kind of want to Actually, you want to know? That's how I listen to it at work. Really? Yep. Why? I'm just like I'm like answering emails, and I have it like just as as background. Well, I mean, noise. it's just because we don't film the podcast, right? We're going to. We're about to be on Patron. Patron isn't that what it's called? You mean Patreon? Patreon, Patron. Same yeah, guy. We actually have a Patreon page. I know we do. We're gonna start being on there, and you guys are gonna start paying to see us record this. JC is shirtless <laughs> right now. <laughs> Nobody's gonna pay to watch this. I'd pay to watch this. I would not pay to watch this. I'd fuck me. I know. I'd fuck me good. I've. That's a movie reference. Bleep this out. Edit that part. I'm not editing this part out. Why don't you edit anything out? If because the, why would if I, the people who have the sh- because the, that the guests because can, if we're editing this because out, if the guests can have you always tell the guests this is his spill before we get someone on we have like a, a five minute powwow with them before and he's always like you have complete con- creative control over this whole thing if anything because you they're want. a guest well I'm the the partial owner you of this podcast you don't I should be able to edit out whatever the fuck I want to edit out nope. I'm the one that does the editing. You edited out the part where I was talking about your nasty ass feet on the last episode. Did I? Yep. I don't think I did. I'm pretty sure you did. I know because I haven't even finished that episode yet. Oh, I was listening to the Tim I, Kennedy episode. Yeah, no, <laughs> no episode. Th- and I was going to leave that in. I was actually going to leave it in. You it's better funny. leave that in. It's, it's funny. It's great. Which, by the way, I did cut my toenails. I see that. <laughs> yeah, you shamed me into. 
They weren't even that long, but you shamed me into they it. They were horribly long. I felt like really self-conscious. You should feel self-conscious. And I got caught on a sock, and it was just a mess. See, and you're yeah. like, God damn you, Big Bo. Yeah, it was. Anywho, um, he's going to edit that part out. I'm not. Um, so if you have a chance, um, if you're on YouTube and you're listening to the Street Warrior podcast, um, go and look up Dick Gregory. He is great as oh well. Oh my god. He is great and then look up um Eric Dubay's 200 proofs. Okay? Do that for me everybody and then get back to me. Uh you can get back to me at info at streetwarriorradio.com Big Bo at streetwarriorradio.com that's b i g b o at streetwarriorradio.com all spelled out no spaces. And don't, don't look those people up. Look them up. Dick Gregory. We're gonna, do, we're gonna do lose. Dick Gregory crystal skulls. We're, no, God, First please don't. Dick Gregory has three of them. Okay. No, he does not. Yes, he. Well, he's dead. So his his estate has them now. Has he ever shown them? He didn't have to show. Oh, he them. just tells you about them. He was. Let me tell you. You want to, you want to hear the story? Oh God. So anyway, do I have a choice. Dick Gregory was like. I spent some time with the Indians. <laughs> and, and there's 13. Oh, no, don't laugh. And there's 13 crystal skulls in the world. I got three of them. Give them to me. Just give them to him. And I lost them. <laughs> he lost them. And then I, call, I called this lady. I said, hey, uh, I ain't got mine no more. And she said, don't worry about it. They'll find you. They'll find you. Went to a hotel. Bam! It was right there on the bed. Oh my god! And I believe Dick Gregory because Dick Gregory wouldn't lie to me. And then look up Eric Dubay's. Don't look up. Don't look. Two hundred proofs that the world is flat. Don't look these people up. YouTube search them. And then welcome down my rabbit. I didn't dig the rabbit hole. I was thrown into it, my brother. Okay, you know what? If you want a view into the mind of Big Bo and what I have to put up with on a daily basis, sure, go ahead and look them up. I send, but I please send don't JC. hold the podcast accountable. For I his send, ridiculousness. I send JC like Dick Gregory videos when I know he's just gotten off shift and he's asleep, so he has to wake up and look at this. He's just like, "What are you doing with your life?" There's a lot of cussing. I love Dick Gregory. Anywho, <sighs> hey, Big Bo is out. Salute. We appreciate y'all listening and thank Mike the Cop one. So this is the part of the podcast where I close, and then he makes fun of me for how I close the podcast. But I'm not going to give him any fuel today. So. Thank you to all the men and women of our armed forces. Thank you for what you do, your sacrifices in keeping us free and safe. Thank you to our first responders, our police, fire, <laughs> paramedics, and all those people that keep us safe at home and help us when we're in need. Please remember your oath and do the right thing to the families of our military and first responders. Thank you so much for your sacrifices and everything that you do. It is noted. We do appreciate it. And for all those other people out there, our supporters, our listeners, our subscribers, our followers, thank you. We love you. We appreciate it. And to all those people out there that make the world go round, thank you so much for what you do. You make the world worth fighting for. And with that, Street Warrior Radio is out of service. <laughs>